Kicking off today's list, we have the sunken city of Dwarka. Until roughly 50 years ago, it was simply a legend, a story passed throughout the ages. The most famous legend about the lost city of Dwarka can be found in the ancient epic of Mahabharata. Dwarka, similar to Atlantis, is said to have sunk beneath the sea at some point in the distant past. According to the sacred scripture of Srimad Bhagavatam, the city of Dwarka was built in response to Jarasandha, the ruler of Magadha, who was constantly attacking Mathura. To prevent further attacks on his clan, Lord Krishna decided to establish a separate city on India's western coast. The city quickly rose to prominence and began the unstoppable pivot of Lord Krishna's mission, housing thousands of people in approximately 900 palaces that were crafted out of silver, gold, and precious stones, along with being heavily fortified and could only be reached by ship. At the time, the city of Dwarka quickly became a talking point around the world, inspiring awe and wonder. According to the Mahabharata's 23rd and 34th stanzas, the city was inundated and submerged by the Arabian sea on the day that Krishna departed the earth to join the spiritual world after 125 years, and this is when the Kali Age began. The ocean's deity reclaimed the land, sinking the lost city of Dwarka, but sparing Lord Krishna's palace. It is also said that the lost city of Dwarka was attacked by Vimana, a flying machine. The description of the fight encourages ancient alien theories, as it appears that it was fought with sophisticated technology and powerful weapons from orbit. The spacecraft launched an attack on the city using energy weaponry, which resembled a lightning strike to onlookers, and it was so devastating that much of the city lay in ruins following the attack. A marine scientist discovered remnants of an underwater civilization near the coast of Dwarka, the city that's still on land that is, in the 1970s, and in 2002, scientists discovered an extremely advanced civilization from the past lying untouched beneath the ocean's surface. With the help of sound matrix and image technology, along with sub-bottom profiling, marine scientists were able to find the exact location of the city, including some stone structures. The lost city of Dwarka was officially found 120 feet underwater in the Gulf of Cambay, Kambat off the western coast coast of India. Thanks to carbon testing, it was established that the city is anywhere between 7,000 to 9,500 years old, and stretches out 7 to 8 kilometers long and 3 to 4 kilometers in width. The most fascinating, or creepy thing about this underwater city, depending on your point of view, is that all human remains are still intact. Ergo, the main reason it made its way to today's list. Look, I'm not a scuba diver, but I can't think I'd be too fond of swimming around casually, admiring, you know, architecture, and BAM! perfectly preserved dead bodies. During the 2002 excavation of Dwarka, many mud vessels, temple bells, ancient ritualistic vessels, and you know, other artifacts were found, with the carbon dating indicating that they date back to roughly 7200 BC, otherwise known as the prehistoric period. At the time of this research, scientists also found that a massive man-made wall that's almost 2,000 feet tall that has since been unearthed during periods of low tide and can't be easily seen. Granted, they're still waiting on absolute results from some strange structures made of iron they weren't able to identify. Maybe they're from the aliens? In fourth place, we have the Antarctica sea spiders. Okay, I'll admit it now, this one might be on the list purely because of how much it made me jump while researching. Seriously, look at the photos of these things. Mm. Yeah, this reaction is genuine. If I get nightmares tonight, I'm blaming you, okay? Before I start talking specifically about the big guys, time to dive into exactly what sea spiders are. Sea spiders are marine arthropods of the Pantopoda order and belong to the Pycnogonida class. They're cosmopolitan, and well, to some of us that sounds like a fancy drink. It just means they're found in oceans around the world. Lucky for me. There's over 1,300 known species, and they have legs ranging from one millimeter to over 70 centimeters in length. And that's over two feet in length. Well, most of them are towards a smaller end of this range, that one qualify as terrifying now. Would it? Although sea spiders are not true spiders, or even arachnids, their traditional classification as chelicerates would place them closer to true spiders than to other well-known arthropod groups, such as insects or crustaceans if correct. Sea spiders tend to either walk along the bottom of the ocean with their stilt-like -like legs, or just swim above it using an umbrella pulsing motion. They're mostly carnivorous predators, or scavengers, that feed on sponges, polychytes, and bryozoans. Alright, time to talk specifically about the big guys. Those really long long legs I mentioned a moment ago are everything to the Antarctic sea spider, since they're where its vital organs are kept, because it doesn't have much of a body. Its proboscis is also important, because that's what it uses to suck the insides out of worms, jellyfish, sponges, and other soft body prey. Sounds delicious, I guess? Right now, all I can picture is like that one scene from The Lion King where Timon and Pumbaa are sucking the insides out of squishy bugs, and I'm pretty sure Simba and I are having the exact same facial reaction. For my brain's sake, it's highly unlikely for most of us to 
ever come across one of the giant spiders since they only live in the oceans around the polar regions. Gigantism has been observed in a number of other Arctic and Antarctic species, leading to biologists to consult a couple of theories that certain elements of the polar environment must be conducive to humongous body size. Over several hypotheses have been put forward, with some scientists claiming that large body size may have developed as an evolutionary trait to enable animals to withstand long periods of starvation during the winter, when resources tend to become you know, scarce in the polar regions. While others have suggested that some of these species may be somehow descended from creatures that invaded the Arctic and Antarctic from the deep sea, where high rates of gigantism have also been recorded. However, a recent study lends support to an entirely different theory, which resolves around the availability of oxygen in the polar oceans, since oxygen is more soluble in cold water than warm water. It has been suggested that this high availability of oxygen, coupled with the fact that low temperatures slow animals' metabolism down and reduce their need for oxygen, could facilitate their gigantism. And hey, they're not venomous, so overall, they're not as dangerous. Uh, but that's not going to stop my fears. In third place, we have the Mariana Trench. I'm just going to apologize in advance because I know I'll slip up at some point, if not every time, and say Mariana's Trench out of habit. I can't help it. They're my favorite band. Even writing up my points today, I kept adding in the extra S. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you're also a fan. The Mariana Trench is an oceanic trench located in the western Pacific Ocean, about 200 kilometers east of the Mariana Islands, and it is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. It's crescent-shaped and measures about 2,550 kilometers in length and 69 kilometers in width. The maximum known depth is roughly over 36,000 feet, plus or minus another 80 feet, which is way too much math for my brain. At the southern end of a small slot shaped valley and its floor known as the Challenger Deep. For reference, if Mount Everest was located at this point in the trench, its peak would still be underwater by more than two kilometers. And just remember, that's the world's tallest mountain we're talking about here, not some cute little hike. The Mariana Trench has been a major area of intrigue throughout history, with the trench first being explored during the Challenger Expedition in 1875 using a weighted rope, which recorded a depth of 26,850 feet. In 1877, a map was published titled the Tiefenkarte de Grosses Oceans, or Depth Map of the Great Ocean, for those of us who don't feel like butchering a pronunciation today. Most recently, in 2011, it was announced at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting that a U.S. Navy hydrographic ship equipped with a multi-beam echo sounder had conducted a survey which mapped the entire trench to 330 feet resolution. As of 2022, 22 crewed descents and 7 uncrewed descents have been achieved. Some notable discoveries over the years include the 1960 expedition, which claimed to have observed large creatures living at the bottom, such as flatfish that were about 30 centimeters long, and shrimp. In July of 2011, a research expedition deployed untethered landers, or drop cams for those of us that prefer simple English, equipped with digital video cameras and lights to explore this deep sea region. Gigantic single-celled organisms with a size of more than 10 centimeters in diameter, belonging to the class of Monothelamia, were observed. Monothelamia are noteworthy for their size, their extreme abundance on the seafloor, and their role as hosts for a variety of organisms. In December of 2014, a new species of snailfish was discovered at a depth of approximately 26,722 feet, breaking the previous record for the deepest living fish seen on video. During that 2014 expedition, several new species were filmed, including amphipods known as supergiants, bringing us back to that deep water gigantism I talked about earlier. Now, before any of y'all go, but Alexa, why is this scary? Well, it's because it's a constant unknown. Being so large and so deep, something new and creepy is discovered every every time people explore its depths. Who knows what's still hiding down there? In second place, we have the blue-ringed octopus. Now, just a little background. An octopus is a soft-bodied, eight-limbed mollusk of the octopoda order that consists of around 300 different species. Like other cephalopods, an octopus is bilaterally symmetric, with two eyes and a beaked mouth at the center point of the eight limbs. The soft body can radically alter its shape, enabling octopuses to squeeze through small gaps. The siphon is used both for respiration and for locomotion by expelling a jet of water. Octopuses have a complex nervous system and excellent sight, and are among the most intelligent and behaviorally diverse of all invertebrates. Octopuses inhabit various regions of the ocean, including coral reefs, pelagic waters, and the seabed. Some live in the intertidal zone and others at 
abyssal depths. All octopuses are venomous, but only the blue ringed octopuses are known to be deadly to humans, ergo why they're my focus today. This specific species can be found in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia, and can be identified by their yellowish skin and characteristic blue and black rings that change color dramatically when threatened. They eat small crustaceans, including crabs, hermit crabs, shrimp, and other small sea animals. Despite their small size, that ranges from 5 to 8 inches in circumference, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked when handled because their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin tetrodotoxin, which can cause loss of all sensations and paralysis of voluntary muscles, including the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, ergo stopping breathing. The full list of possible side effects from the venom include nausea, heart failure, severe and total paralysis, blindness, and can lead to death within minutes. The blue ringed octopus carries enough venom to kill 26 adult humans within minutes. I'm just going to repeat that to be clear, 26 adult humans within minutes. Their bites are tiny and often painless, with many victims not realizing they have been envenomated until respiratory depression and paralysis begins. Oh, and by the way, there is no such thing as blue ringed octopus antivenom available. And finally, in first place we have the stonefish. Now, you might be asking, after the deadly octopus and a literal pit in the ocean, how can we get scarier? Welcome to where I almost jumped out of my chair and onto the floor. Stonefish are a family of fish called Cynocidae. They are famous for being the most venomous fish in the world, with a sting that causes excruciating pain in, you guessed it, humans. Their venom is lethal to other marine animals and humans, causing intense pain, breathing problems, damage to the heart, fits, and paralysis. Now, thankfully, unlike the blue ringed octopus, there is an anti venom, but if it's not delivered quickly, the effects can be. Fatal. We know of five different species that exist. The midget stonefish, or the Cynocea alula, Estororhine stonefish, or Cynocea orida, the Red Sea stonefish, or Cynocea nana, the Cynocea platyrincha, and simply the stonefish, or Cynocea verrucos. Look, I tried my best. They hail from the coastal regions of the Indo Pacific Ocean, so northern Australia, India, the Philippines, and others. Their name comes from their ability to blend in with rocky seafloors and amongst coral, which is what makes them easily stepped on by people and is a good chunk of the danger. They have 13 spines along their backs, which is what delivers the toxin, and at the base of each spine is a venom sac, which is activated under pressure. So, you know, when somebody accidentally steps on them. Now, if that's not terrifying enough for you, because we do have a reputation to uphold here, scientists at the University of Kansas have discovered that stonefish also have a hidden switchblade in their face that they can flick out whenever they feel like they're in danger. They call this bony, blade-like protrusion a lacrimal saber, and it's located on a bone under the fish's eyes. The saber is housed inside the fish's head, and they use their cheek muscles to deploy it. One good thing, at least, is that it's not venomous like their spines. Number five, or fish. Coming in at the number five spot is this terrifying 16 foot long monstrosity hauled out of the ocean by Chilean fishermen. Shocking those who learned, like me, that fish can be five meters long sometimes. The clip was posted to TikTok where it went viral almost immediately, sweeping up 10 million views pretty quickly. Most people worried this fish might be a bringer of bad times, and there might be an inkling of truth to that. This fish, called an oar fish, is thought in some cultures to be an omen of impending bad fortune. I mean, I understand it completely. If, if I picked this thing out of the water, I would not think that I had been blessed by good fortune. In Japanese folklore, this fish is sometimes referred to as Ryogo no Tsukai, translating to the messenger from the sea god's palace, and I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. I'm so very sorry. It's linked to the legend of Namazu, a giant sea snake which caused earthquakes whenever it would rise. Or fish live deep, deep, deep in the depths of the sea. And some scientists theorize that they only ever rise nearer to surface level whenever there's a disturbance in the tectonic plates, which would definitely make this fish a bad omen and a bringer of earthquakes. Now the actual ore fish, once you get aside all the legend, terrifying as it might look, is a bit of a gentle giant. It's the largest bony fish in the world, and it isn't much of a predator, preferring to swim around just hoovering up plankton. They barely even have teeth, to be honest, and they don't really pose a threat to humans. Unless you consider scaring the heck out of you a threat. You want to watch more scary sea creature videos? Well, I got great news for you because we have loads upon loads on the channel. Number four, green eyed shark. Now, if the ocean is where all the scariest stuff in the world is hiding, that goes triple for any body of water around Australia, which is home to some of the actual most terrifying entities ever to walk the planet and swim the planet and fly the planet. It's where they send the animals that are too hardcore for the rest of the world. An Australian angler, Trapman Bermagee, pulled out this disgusting wretch of a fish some 2,000 feet beneath the sea. He captioned it, 
The face of a deep sea rough skinned shark. A little bit of a fake Australian accent there, I, I can't help it. Unsurprisingly, most commenters wanted to point out how disgusting the thing was, which is very similar to what I'm doing now. Now usually I'm a sucker for green eyes, but not on this leathery little monster. This thing looks like a baseball glove that came to life. I, I'm not having it. There's actually a lot of debate as to what this little thing is. Some commenters had suggested that it was a cookie cutter shark, which might sound adorable when you hear that. That sounds pretty cute, but I promise you it is not cute at all. A cookie cutter shark is named that because of its jagged mouth, which leaves cookie cutter like imprints on its victims, just like big holes in anything that it's biting at. However, the fisherman pointed out this wasn't a cookie cutter shark. A cookie cutter shark looks absolutely vile, but in a very different way. A cookie cutter shark looks more like a mole rat that was left in the sun for a few weeks, whereas this thing looks like it was grilled before ever being born. Now another commenter suggested that this shark could be something called an endeavor spur dog shark, which is a mouthful and a half. Now whatever the creature is, it goes without saying, I want very little to do with this shark. Number three, long nosed chimera. You wouldn't really expect anything horrifying to exist in Newfoundland. It's a very pleasant place. You think it's mostly just chips and jigs dinner all the way down. Well, for Gary Goodyear, a fisherman out of Templeman, Newfoundland, he pulled this long nosed chimera out of the water and gave himself quite the shock. His nets went some 2,000 feet down into the water where he unearthed this long beaked mystery fish. When he pulled it up, the crew could not believe what they had seen. It was not at all what they were expecting. I have to include this quote from one of the articles because it's just, it's too new fee not to include. Goodyear said, We're hauling away and by and by I seen this coming around the roller. I said, good god what in the heck is that? Now when he first pulled it up, he wondered at first if it might have been a platypus because of the impressive snoot on the beast. He described this pelagic nightmare's beak as being very rubbery, like cartilage. No one on the boat had any idea what they had found, so they kept the body of the fish and took it to a local fishery in the hopes that someone could properly ID their mystery monster. Luckily, somebody actually knew and it got correctly identified as a long-nosed chimera, an ancient deep sea dwelling fish famous for its green eyes and, putting this gently, its monstrous appearance. The reason that its nose felt like cartilage is because the fish is completely cartilage from nose to tail. It's actually boneless. So this fish is a spineless coward. The creature most likely perished as it was being pulled up. An extreme pressure change from being 2,000 feet beneath the sea gave it a serious case of the bends. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise because I'm not sure I'd want to see this thing alive. I'm not sure I'd want to see it thrashing around on the floor of a commercial fishing boat. I think that wouldn't be good for anybody. Number two, decorator crab. Our next spot comes to us all the way from Thailand. Some local fishermen in Koh Yao Noi pulled up their nets while fishing for crabs and discovered they'd brought up an alien looking creature with them that mystified them. They couldn't identify this thing. Take a look at this creepy little crawly. Kind of looks like a spider that's got a good fashion sense, got really into accessorizing. But it almost kind of looks like it shouldn't be moving at all. Like it's just some garbage that got cursed into being alive or maybe some seaweed that developed sentience. The fishermen were understandably pretty puzzled by this thing. So they decided to post a video of the then unidentified critter hoping to get some answers and for once the internet was actually helpful. The creature was correctly identified as a decorator crab, which is not something I'd heard of before this video, but I am so glad I learned about it and I am even happier that I can pass it on to you. A decorator crab gets its name for its habit of using whatever it can scavenge around its environment to make into camouflage from predators. Now the really cool thing is that they'll use literally anything they can find. Debris, garbage, They'll even use little bits of other animals in a gruesome manner like fins or parts of a crab shell. If it can be attached to it in some way, a decorator crab will stick it to itself. They're covered in tiny Velcro-like hairs that allow them to attach their findings easily. I, I would love having that. It would save me so much time getting dressed. They've been recorded chewing on things like kelp or seaweed to break them down into more easily attachable accessories. Now most of the creatures on this list have been weird and scary and kind of look horrifying and I'm not gonna lie, the decorator crab kind of looks pretty scary too, but I absolutely adore the decorator crab. It is showing up every other creature in the ocean when it comes to outfits. I love the garbage costume. It's given camp in a very good way. This thing is like a crab lady gaga and I love it. Number one, ghost shark. 
Roman Fedortsov routinely entertains his 600,000 Instagram followers with pictures of all the strange creatures he fishes up while sailing around Murmansk, a port city in Russia. His Instagram is a treasure trove of scary undersea finds, and I absolutely recommend that you toss him a follow if you're into this sort of thing, as he's kind of the head honcho for it. This video could easily just have been five things that he fished out himself. He, like, nobody is pulling out weird things the way Roman is. But with so many to choose from, I had a tough time, but I landed on this here fish, sometimes called Frankenstein's fish. Due to the stitches all over its body looking like it's been sewn together from the bodies of several other fishes. It's also been referred to as a rat fish, a ghost shark, a spook fish, but officially they're known as ghost chimeras. I like that it's got nothing but scary nicknames. These things are bad news from teeth to tail. They have a spiny dorsal fin that's poisonous to the touch. It's got a mouth of rat-like teeth that helps it grind down anything it catches, crushing its prey in its jaws. Usually goes after things like crabs or prawns, so the rat teeth help pulverize the shells. These little things also have an inherent ability to detect the electric fields produced by other creatures, and I wish I knew even the littlest bit about biology because this fish sounds like it's magic. Fish also sounds overpowered, not gonna lie. Now I think it's a little treat. We ought to have a little slideshow at the end of just a bunch of Fedortsov's weirdest catches and I'll just react to them. Ready? Okay, here we go, lightning round. Who would make this? Why would a creature evolve like this? I guarantee you this thing looks cuter as sashimi. That, that is a face not even Mother Nature could love, if that even is a face. You know what, this one, I'm actually kind of coming around to. I wouldn't touch it, I wouldn't order it, but I kind of like it. Number five, Wolverine fish. Hugh Jackman, if you're watching this and you like scary stuff, this first one's for you, my dude. In 2021, there were more than 200 new species of just freshwater fish discovered alone. Just freshwater, hopefully in Cistrus Wolverine. Okay, that's a pretty badass name. And a badass looking fish. There is no way in hell I'm taking that thing off of a hook with my hands. Are you kidding me? And you wouldn't want to either, because these fishes have strong lateral curved spikes called undontus tucked underneath their gills, which at any time they can extend and jab at their prey with these spiky prong-like claws, hence the name. For those of you who don't know Wolverine, he's an X-Men with claws. It kind of goes hand in hand here, you know? The Wolverine fish is actually a catfish, however, that grows up to only about six or seven inches long. They get their name from both the barbed razor sharp prongs associated with them and the temper and aggression inside of them. Yeah, so like full blown Wolverine style anger. Luckily for us, they live in between rocks found so far in the Brazilian river of Rio Zingu in the lower Amazon that I don't think you're going to swim into any one of these soon. I feel like that's where the scariest fish are, the Amazon. Also, kind of confusing biologists, so many species and names alike but not alike. Catfish, wolf fish, half wolf, half man, X-men fish. Like every day there's a new fish. Wolverine fish are only herbivores and graze on algae and detritus tucked away deep under rocks. So the likelihood of you just like stepping on one of these are pretty low. Might scare you away from their home, but they won't eat you. Just don't go flipping over any rocks and reaching underneath murky water in the Amazon. That's all I can say for this one. Number four, alien fish? Well, one magnificent alien fish, Advena magnifica, which translates to magnificent alien, hence the name. No, no, it's not from outer space or anything, don't panic. Technically, it's not even a fish. This sea sponge literally gets its name because it just looks like E.T. Hey, I didn't name it, they did. To be fair, it does look like E.T. the alien, come on. The long neck, the huge head, the big eyes, it's literally perfect. This year, a new sea sponge was discovered officially. Well, plucked back in 2017, but they're sure now that it's a completely new species. Over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean, research team from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History came upon a mesmerizing seascape. Dr. Chris Ma of the team dubbed the scene, quote, a forest of the weird. The sea sponge rises up from the seafloor to look exactly onto the direction of the current, mouth open, hoping to swallow up some bacteria to eat. That's sick, just an alien sponge sticking their ET heads out, catching the breeze, hoping for some fast food. Doesn't sound like a bad gig. The two holes of the sponge that give it its signature ET eyes appearance are clearly visible on the outside of its head. These holes, technically oscules, serve as openings of which the sponge pumps water out of. The sponge is covered in even tinier pores where the water is drawn into the sponge along with tasty bacteria and other small prey. Just sucked in through small chambers and the water's pumped out through a bunch of canals. 
Christiana Castello Branco, the researcher who found this deep sea gray, explains the importance of this discovery by saying, quote, as all of these organisms are intricately connected, by documenting and describing marine biodiversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on Earth. Uh, yeah, 100% we're all connected. Let's give these little dudes some clean water. How about that, people, all right? No more Mountain Dew bottles just thrown into the lake. Pick it up. Number three, bulldog fish. Catfish, wolverine fish, now bulldog fish. When are we just gonna have a fish fish, you know? The bulldog fish, or the Zanactinus otix. That sounds like a Decepticon, doesn't it? Zanactinus otix? Roll out. Bots, Autobots. <laughs> Never mind. This thing can truly teach a new dog some old tricks. Like 90 million years old tricks, because our newest discovery is actually a really, really old one. Extinct, extinct, thankfully. You wouldn't want to haul this thing up in your net. The Dino of the Week blog states that some of the longest bulldog fish ever may have once even measured up to six meters long. Uh, yeah, that's like a regular sized shark. The bulldog fish fossils may be quite valuable as well. A fully intact, complete framed specimen sold for about 110,000 at Sotheby's auction house. Is this the reason fish and chips are so expensive nowadays? Like what's going on here? This scary dude roamed the warm shallow waters of the Western Interior Seaway that split America in two halves during the upper Cretaceous period. Distinguished by their heavy bony skull and armed to the tooth with teeth like a nightmare, last year, Andy Moore, a local fisherman, made a discovery while taking part in a fishing competition in Nebraska. When he brought his kayak over to free his line, he first thought that it was a skeleton of something that recently died, so he just returned back to his tournament. He contacted the sheriff's department after the tournament, worried, and they got back to him saying it was his lucky day. Dude, imagine just reeling in a 90 million year old fish during a fishing tournament. Like, I hope he won. That's definitely first place, isn't it? Oh, Andy? Oh yeah, caught a 90 millioner, yeah. Number two, the barrel eye fish. Tubular eyes, bro. No, seriously, you're Tubular eyes actually are very rare and also significantly puzzling. Say hello to the barrel eye fish or the Macropinna microstoma from the Opus thoproctus species, meaning backwards in Greek, to signify their uniquely designed flipped up eyes luminously inside alive in their head, or backwards. Generally directed upwards and back to detect the silhouettes of both predator and prey, although they can move their eyes back to forward. Basically, they have a sunroof above their head that they can look up from inside their own head. Hey, that's pretty tubular, bruh. They can be found deep in tropical waters in the twilight zone, between 600 and 800 meters down. There are fish that gaze upwards through their transparent heads with eyes like mesmerizing emerald orbs. These domes are huge spherical lenses that sit on a pair of long silvery eye tubes, hence its common name. The barrel eye fish has a green tint over their eyes, which even acts as kind of like a sunglasses to help them track down prey in any sort of lighting. There is literally nowhere to hide, even for a bioluminescent fish. Barrel eyes are one step ahead the entire time. After years of only seeing dead, net caught specimens, in 2021, Bruce Robinson with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California and their high def cameras finally got a pretty good look at these dudes using remotely operated vehicles. Dude, these are apparently really rare. Side note, is this how fish are evolving? Like their heads are becoming see-through all of a sudden? Cause this is terrifying. Like imagine a shark with a sunroof. Number one, the snapping shrimp. This little guy, the snapping shrimp, AKA the pistol shrimp, AKA muscle in the alpha die family. It sounds like a mafia family, doesn't it? Hey, I'm a pistol shrimp with the alpha die family. Who's asking? This little thing. This little thing can literally create a sonic boom under the water right before and as it's attacking you. That's not scary at all. It's so fast you literally don't even know what's happening due to the stun alone and how fast it is. You won't see it coming. You might hear it coming. This thing's sound is that big, it creates a sonic boom. We know nothing, Jon Snow. Like, they're apparently found in coral reefs and oyster reefs. These pistol shrimp hit their prey at over 100 kilometers per hour. In doing so, a large air bubble is created, and because of this Mike Tyson shrimp is so quick with the jab, the following pop is around 200 decibels. It has a punching hand and a claw hand, like a jab and a cross. The sound stuns their prey first and resembles sticks breaking or cracking of a knuckle under the water. But don't panic, not in any lakes or freshwater, they live in tropical seas. They're usually muddy green or orange in color, usually only about that big. Scientists found that actual light is produced when the bubble pops due to the high temperature and pressure under the water. 
They're the only ones so far that can do this. I mean, this is pretty sick and also pretty terrifying. The knowledge that fish are starting to learn how to flashbang other fish, like they're clearing a room in Call of Duty. Dude, that's where I draw the line. I'm not going swimming anymore at all. Number five on this list is a mistake. So I know that's kind of weird. How do you discover a mistake? Well, in a story from One Dumb Diver, and yeah, that is their actual handle, they do just that. They write, when I was 15, I took the family boat out and dove the reef myself to clear my head. That was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of about 90 feet when I was only rated for 60. While diving, I spotted a three and a half meter mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean and they only have two speeds. Curious, which is harmless, and lunch. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do since there was no way for me to escape it. Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve, the idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, it occurred to me, that I'd left my sleeve on my bed. I had my knife drawn, however now I had a series of problems. I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and trailed blood everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt water and open wounds, they don't feel too good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing more than a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down into my tricep and detached it, and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. So that story right there, folks, is why I personally don't think I'm ever going deep sea diving. I love sharks, they're super cool, I love to learn about sharks, but I am more than happy to keep them in a tank at the aquarium and learn about them in that way. Swimming with them or discovering one in front of you on the day that you also forgot your protective gear, not something that sounds like a great time. Number four on this list is a barracuda. El Herrera 9519 writes, one time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and then slowly Slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore, but still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little bit more aware of her surroundings when diving. So I looked it up and barracudas can grow to be 1.8 meters in length. Pair that with their extremely sharp teeth and the fact that shiny objects remind them of the little silver fish that they eat and you have yourself in a pretty bad situation. The woman in this story is honestly extremely lucky that this fish waited to decide if it was going to attack or not. Most times she wouldn't have had time to respond and it would have just gone to take a bite. Considering this necklace would have been around her neck, having a barracuda bite into it could have ended very badly. Number three on this list is a kelp forest. Duct Tape Jedi writes, After a day of boat diving in Monterey Bay on the California coast, we had a night dive planned. I was there with two friends celebrating my birthday and we were part of a larger group of divers. My friends were too tired for the night dive and I was too, but I got invited to buddy with another diver whose friends also decided to stay on the boat. So I was following my new buddy through the kelp when some of it caught on my tank. I tried to pull clear but managed to get tangled even more to the point where I was unable to move. I kept shining my light around looking for my buddy but he was nowhere to be seen. After what seemed like an hour but was possibly just a few minutes, I felt some of the kelp loosen up and then saw that my buddy was cutting it off with a knife. I was so exhausted after struggling that when we got to the surface, he had to tow me back to the boat. So discovering a full on kelp forest, I mean, that would honestly be really cool, I think. Obviously what happened to our diver would have been incredibly scary though. Having to wrestle for over an hour or however long he was there for with some kelp in the dark, probably thinking that you're going to drown, 
doesn't sound great. But if you did discover a kelp forest and that didn't happen, then I think it'd be pretty sweet. If you're going to go though, then make sure you carry your own knife because you wouldn't want to end up like our friend here. Number two on this list is a body. This story is from Texas Guy 911 and he says, I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced cave divers than I was. I'm leading the dive as to get used to the pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession and they're mentoring me. The known horrible visibility makes it impossible to navigate by compass so we follow a line put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So I know I'm about to hit a small sunken boat but I don't remember which one. There are a few similar in a row in the same state of decay. I'm the first in the group and I get to the boat and I see someone's black army boots sticking out from the inner quarters. It looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. It's hard to see due to so much muck in the water. So I touch the boot, thinking it's by itself, but it won't lift, like it's attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and now I see the second leg. I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascent to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face. Nobody wants to go to the surface, but it's a rule that if one says up, others in the group must abort, no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what's a diver's sign for a corpse? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though I'm trying to stay calm and take time. So, we're on the lake's surface. I have this adrenaline rush, can't breathe enough. So I tell them there's a body down there. I see rolling eyes from everyone once they see I'm serious. I describe in detail what I saw and then we go down again. Once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backward as there are several boats on the line and who knows in which boat the body is in and how far we drifted while taking it out on the surface. Well, we find all the boats before seeing the original one, of course. So our customary leader goes into the boat's cabin and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So so gluing information together from what we learned later on, it actually turns out the police or some other agency had body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safe keeping. So that didn't turn out to be an actual body, but I still think this would have been super scary to feel a leg and then another leg in the darkness of the water like that on one of your first dives. I mean, that would be a lot. Maybe I'm just weak because deep sea diving is just not for me, but honestly, that would have scarred me for potentially life, whether the body is real or not. Number one on this list is a survivor. Off the coast of Nigeria roughly eight years ago, a tugboat broke down and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Three whole days later, a diving crew went out to the wreckage to see what was down there and recover the dead bodies. It was thought that no one could have possibly survived the crash and that all 12 people on the boat were dead. That's why the crew was so shocked when they found someone had actually survived. Maybe this doesn't seem as scary as finding someone who had died, but we're lucky enough to have the actual clip of them recovering this person and just watch as the hand comes out. All right, you found one, yeah? He's alive, he's alive. He's alive. The startled dive team discovered the tugboat's cook had survived for three days. So that one image of having a hand reach out of the dark and stormy nothing would have actually terrified me. Not to mention that man who survived down there. That would have been three days by himself surviving in this tiny air pocket, most likely believing that the world has left you for dead. This is definitely one of those scary discoveries that's for the better because someone's life was saved, but as the Reddit user Edgar writes, I can't imagine how creepy and unexpected it would be to be on a mission to recover the dead and have a hand reach out to you like it did. Number five, 54 hands. In cartoons, you know, Tom and Jerry, Looney Tunes, that kind of thing, they're always fishing out stock garbage, like a fish skeleton or maybe a boot. And I always thought that was pretty funny. You know, imagine pulling up just a totally random thing out of the water. I imagine it's a lot less funny in real life though, pulling up severed body parts or 54 severed body parts, you know, kind of like pieces of a terrible puzzle. In 2018, fishermen in the Beshenyenye channel of the Amur River made a horrifying discovery when they fished up a bag containing 54 severed human hands. I think we can all agree that's probably one of the worst things ever that you could probably fish up. That's got to be very low at the bottom. 
At first they pulled up a single hand and that would have been enough to make this list and then the fishermen shortly pulled up 53 other severed hands in a little sack. <laughs> Someone out there is missing a collection, clearly. Now I don't know a ton about Siberia's wildlife, but severed hands aren't indigenous to Siberia's rivers and lakes, meaning someone put them here. Investigators gave no clues as to who the hands might have belonged to at one point or why they were all discarded in this manner. The hands were wrapped in plastic shoe covers and bandages and police took fingerprints from the hands to see if maybe they could be traced, maybe they could get some back to their owners. Now theories about why 54 severed hands in a bag washed up have unsurprisingly prompted a lot of wild speculation. I mean, really, you can kind of take your pick where you want to go with this. Severed as part of some punishment of a, a crime syndicate, a lone lunatic with a collection, some sort of demonic satanic ritual, or is it something deeply macabre but explainable? Now, a prevailing theory from local police is that the hands came from a medical scenario, and that means amputations, cadavers, students does not nearly begin to explain how 54 of them ended up in a bag and then in the river though and to think they would probably still be there if it wasn't the right hook at the right time weird thing to think about and if you're looking for way more videos about scary sea creatures they don't all have to be hands we got loads and loads more on the channel we love freaky stuff deep beneath the water so click through Hit subscribe, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a video, but if you wouldn't mind, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more freaky things found on the fishing lines coming up for you right now. Coming in at the number four spot is this terrifying 16 foot long monstrosity hauled out of the ocean by Chilean fishermen. Shocking those who learned suddenly that fish can be five meters long sometimes. A clip of the oarfish was posted to TikTok where it went viral almost immediately. Little fishy fever, so it beat up 10 million views. Most people worried this fish might be a bringer of bad times and there might be an inkling of truth to that. The fish is called an ore fish and it's thought to be an omen of impending bad fortune which I understand completely. If I was having a nice day on the water and I pulled this thing out, I would not think that I had been blessed. I would not think that good things were about to happen to me. In Japanese folklore, this fish is sometimes referred to as Ryogo no Tsukai, translating the messenger from the sea god's palace. Linked to the legend of Namazu, a giant sea snake which caused earthquakes whenever it would rise. Now, oarfish live deep, deep, deep in the depths of the sea, really way down there. And there's a theory that they only rise nearer to the surface level whenever there's a disturbance of the tectonic plates. That's the big crust that makes all the earthquakes happen, which would definitely make this fish a bad omen and a bringer of earthquakes, and you understand where the folklore behind it would come from. But Here's something for you. The actual oarfish, terrifying as it looks, is a gentle giant. It's the largest bony fish in the whole world, and it isn't much of a predator, so don't worry about it. It looks like it could swoop you up whole. It's not going to. It prefers to swim around hoovering up plankton. They barely even have teeth, actually. And they don't pose a threat to humans at all, unless you consider scaring the heck out of you a threat. And I hope not, otherwise I'd be threatening you guys every single day twice a day. Number three, basket star. Now whenever I do these videos about the ocean and all manner of strange monstrosities that live beneath the trenches, I feel like I discover all these new species and more often than not, the species I discover are ones that I probably would have been fine not knowing existed on this earth with me. When I find out for even 50 seconds of these things live on earth, oh, Puts the fear of God into me. Makes me understand that I could die. Look, I like ocean creatures fine enough, but whenever we do these videos, I just think about how they deal, and I can't imagine our next creature would feel pleasant. This horrible little bundle of spaghetti is called a basket star. It's a very ugly looking fish. I'm sorry, basket star. I mean not to pass judgment. It's just that you're ugly. Maybe a basket star came up on your TikTok timeline recently when an angler from Singapore caught the strange creature and posted a video of it, gaining viral traction as we all came to gawk at the weird tentacled creature. The angler, one Ramlin same, caught the basket star on one of his usual fishing spots off Pula Ubin. The creature was writhing and wriggling with what looked like more than a hundred wiggly little appendages. Ugh. It just, it, it looks like all the stuff that collects at the bottom of the sink, you know? <laughs> looks like if you put your finger in that, you'd never get it back. I just don't like looking at it. At the time, he thought at first that it was just a bit of seaweed being pushed around by the waves, and when he pulled it up, he thought that it 
possibly the creature was an alien, which I totally get. If I pulled this thing out of the water, I would be calling the FBI. Now, while that would have been pretty cool, it's just this freaky little critter. Now, because they're deep sea creatures, it's rare that humans get to see basket stars up close or study them, which is what made Ramlin's catch all that much more interesting. We actually don't know a ton about these bizarre little creatures. But the other thing that made it so interesting is just because, come on, look at how weird this little pile of noodles is. That exists. That exists on the same planet as you. <laughs> Number two, a giant prehistoric skull. Generally, when you're going fishing, the goal is to catch a fish, maybe even two fish if you're getting wild. So imagine the surprise when you find a prehistoric skull on the end of your line. Raymond McElroy, no relation to the podcast Empire, and his assistant Charlie Coyle were shocked to discover a massive heaving elk skull with a gigantic pair of antlers on the other end of their hook. According to scientists who carbon dated it, the skull dates back nearly 11,000 years. Now, shockingly, the water they were fishing in was only about 20 feet deep when they discovered the elk skull. You'd think someone would have tripped over it in 11,000 years or dug it out by now, but hey, fate works in very mysterious ways that I don't claim to understand or try to. I can try to imagine pulling a giant skull out of the water though. Charlie Coyle was shocked by it saying, I thought it was the devil himself. I was gonna throw it back in. I didn't know what to do with it. At the very least, hanging it up as living room decor, man, above the fireplace, above the mantle, it would go great. Now, the skulls and the antlers of the giant elk once belonged to an extinct ancient species known as the Megaloceros giganteus. And I know I'm gonna end up making a bunch of videos about the Megaloceros the way I did the Megalodon and the Titanoboa, it's entirely possible. This species has been extinct for well, nearly 11,000 years and was one of the largest species of deer to ever trot around the world. How it ended up in a lake in Ireland, get caught by a pair of fishermen, kind of above my pay grade. But hey, I don't solve the mysteries here. I just ask them and speculate blindly. And number one, a ghost shark. Oh. Roman Fedorzov routinely entertains his 600,000 Instagram followers with pictures of all the bizarre monstrosities he pulls out of the sea while sailing around Murmansk. That's a port city in Russia. His Instagram is a treasure trove of scary undersea finds. It's one of my favorite things on my feed, and I absolutely recommend you give him a follow on any of his social media platforms if you're into this sort of thing, as he is the head honcho for it. This video could easily have just been five things he posted on his account. Like I said, this guy is the king of weird stuff in the water. Right here is a fish of many names, sometimes called Frankenstein's fish, due to the stitches all over its body looking like it's like sewn together from all these different fish. It's also been referred to as a rat fish, a ghost shark, a spook fish, <laughs> but officially they're known as ghost chimeras. These things are bad news from teeth to tail. They got a spicy door. They do not have a spicy dorsal fin. They might taste amazing, but I doubt it. I mean, look at the fucking thing. They have a spiny dorsal fin that's poisonous to the touch. It's got a mouth of rat-like teeth that helps it grind down anything it catches, crushing its prey in its jaws. Now, it usually goes after delicious things like crabs and prawn, so the rat teeth help pulverize tough shelves. You're not really supposed to eat the shells, but it's a fish. Nobody told it that. It also makes for a very handy nutcracker. Now, these little predators also have an inherent ability to detect the electric fields produced by other creatures. I'm just reading fun facts off a Wikipedia page. I wish I even knew the littlest bit about biology because that makes this fish sound magic. I didn't know fish had like electricity. I should have paid attention in school. Too late. Now I'm here. Now I'm reading YouTube. I could have had a different career. Now, I think as a little treat while I reassess my life and my career path, we ought to have a slideshow of just a bunch of Fedortsov's weirdest catches. We'll do a little lightning round of some freaky sea critters and I'll react to them. We'll have fun. It's gonna be a great way to end the video. We're all gonna laugh. All right, here we go. Ready, ready? Baby, that's, not, that's a face not even mother nature could love. I don't mind this one. I wouldn't touch it, but I like it. I like it, the cut of its jib. I'd play cards with this one. Buddy, toss that one back in the water. I don't ever want to see that again. Don't ever put that up on my screen again. I don't ever want to see that. Number five on this list is a giant eel. This is a true story that comes in from a Reddit user, RCMW181. They write, 
An old World War II ammunition ship off the south coast of England was full of brass topped shells. Most had been taken by divers over the years and it was now very rare to see them apart from a pile in one corner of the ship. The pile of shiny brass metals was miraculously untouched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater and you only found out why if you swam near them. Out of the murky darkness the largest eel I have ever seen snakes forward. Without exaggeration this thing had a head the same size as a horse's head full of jagged teeth. I could not see the body as it looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. Turns out for years this thing had been guarding the shiny brass shells, slithering over them making them shine. We found out at a bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said eels are like magpies and like shiny things. There are multiple scary discoveries in this story in my opinion. First off, our reddit user just glosses over the fact that they're in a sunken World War II munitions ship. They don't say so, but I would have imagined that people would have died on that ship when it sunk and there may have even been some remains of the dead still down there. Then to come face to face with a giant eel that is extremely protective over these brass shells would be terrifying. If that was a giant moray eel, then those creatures can grow up to two and a half meters in length and can be very deadly in the water. Had that creature interpreted what our diver was doing as threatening, then they may not have made it to shore later that day to be able to share the story. Number four on this list is a freezer. This story from a reddit user is just all kinds of creepy. Count underscore dynamo writes, I've done a number of dives and the strangest thing I ever saw was a large deep freezer with a heavy industrial chain wrapped around multiple times with about five cinder blocks attached. It was very rusted and the deep freezer itself had to have been 30 years old, probably more. This was about 90 feet just off of Vancouver Island, Canada. The situation gave myself and the other divers the heebie-jeebies. Logged the GPS and depth coordinates and notified the police. We were able to find out what was inside since one of the divers had friends with the local police. 10 porcelain dolls. Now for starters, I'm actually kind of happy that they found porcelain dolls inside that freezer because when I was initially reading that story and heard about a freezer that was locked up and weighed down, I initially thought of a dead body, but having 10 porcelain dolls raises a lot of questions. Were these dolls potentially cursed and that was the only way to get rid of them? If you've ever come in contact with a cursed doll, then locking it up is the first thing to do. Ed and Lorraine prove it with their handling of the Annabelle doll. If these dolls are cursed though, then this discovery gets even more scary. Clearly whoever locked them in that freezer threw them to the bottom of the ocean and didn't want them to be found, bringing them back up to the surface probably wasn't the best idea. Number three on this list is a color change. Now, a color change doesn't really sound that scary at all, but in this particular case, it's definitely pretty creepy. A diver writes, I was diving off the coast of Fiji and we went through a natural tunnel, like a 10 meter cave slash passage through a rock formation. So we start swimming through the cave and suddenly the light was weird, like the blue tint from the water has been replaced by a red one. Now all divers will know that this isn't only weird because the color changed, but also because red is the first color to disappear after a certain depth, usually between 30 to 40 feet, and we were well over 70 feet. Also bear in mind this was late morning on a sunny day. So imagine this scene, me and my dive buddy are going through an underwater cave and suddenly everything for no apparent reason is tinted red, a color that you were literally supposed to be unable to see while diving at that depth during the day. Upon exiting the cave everything was back to blue. I thought it was just me so I didn't signal to go back up. After the dive my buddy asked me if I'd seen the water tint red as well. We can't explain it and the folks from the local dive shop had no idea what we were talking about. Now that story is super weird. We've got to keep in mind that these guys were 70 feet below the surface at that point. If I was 70 feet below the surface and everything changed colors to a deep red, I would be very scared for my life. Obviously we don't know for sure, but it sounds like that cave that they stumbled upon is haunted by something. It's either haunted by something or that particular cave can produce some strange light phenomenon. Either way, it would have been very frightening and I'm glad that the two divers in this story made it out okay. Number two on this list is a school of sharks. The next discovery comes in from a professional diver in the Bahamas who was diving down to recover a dead body. What's crazy about this story is that the dead body isn't the scary part. His online name is Keith Bell and he writes, 
After an hour or two of searching, I went back into the blue hole to see if there were any signs of him. Saw the glint of his watch and his arm sticking out near the bottom. Started descending down to the bottom to recover the body. On the way down, realized that the bottom was a school of sharks that must have been there for breeding. So many sharks that they blocked the view of the actual bottom. Descended into darkness, grabbed his arm, couldn't stand to look at the body, and started ascending. The sharks followed and were circling around the both of us. Had to take a break at halfway at around 60 feet as to not get the bends. Extremely scared. The entire time waiting to normalize being super scared. Victim was struck by a passing boat. So not only is finding a dead body underwater super scary in my opinion, but to stumble upon so many sharks that you can't even see the bottom of the ocean. That's beyond terrifying. Then to have said sharks follow you up to the surface, deciding whether or not they're going to eat you would have been absolutely brutal. He didn't specify what type of sharks they were, but after doing some research, sharks tend to get far more aggressive during mating and therefore the risk of our divers getting attacked is significantly increased. Also, the number of sharks that can gather during mating season can rise into the hundreds. One shark is scary enough and will likely win in a fight, but tens to even hundreds of them would have easily had their way with this diver. Not sure about you guys, but if that was me, I would be exclusively a land dweller from then on out. Number one on this list is a person. People aren't typically scary discoveries, but in this case by some deep sea divers, it definitely was. One diver writes, me and two buddies were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1am and we're a good 100 feet deep, the darkest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Only this time, we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort, so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1am and we'd see nobody else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone, which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold, but this dude was in a wetsuit with exposed skin. We thought we saw a giant gash on one of his legs. So the three of us all notice him and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs and the guy just smiles, waves, and then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up like in an alley at night, it's weird. A hundred feet underwater at night is terrifying. After reading this story, I got some serious ghost vibes. Now obviously I can't know for sure and those divers didn't either, but this man just appeared out of nowhere and had a giant gash on his leg. He also wasn't wearing the proper gear and they didn't see him enter the water when they were getting ready to go. Potentially, rather than just be another diver out and about, this is the ghost of someone who went diving and died. Now their spirit just swims through the ocean for eternity. I've read a lot of ghost stories and reports of sightings before, and that has all the telltale signs of one. Number five, Siphonophores. Now, what you're looking at right now definitely looks alien. It looks like something out of one of the Avatar movies. It looks like a giant sea serpent, right? What it actually is, is one long organism made up of countless individual creatures joined together called siphonophores. Now, siphonophores are some of the weirdest and most fascinating creatures in the ocean. They're a type of like colony. They're a living colony that consists of multiple individual creatures called zooids. Each one has their own specialized function and they all work together. Together. From their appearance and behavior, there's not really a lot of things like siphonophores out there. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all share a basic structural design. They consist of a long, slender stem, or like a stalk, with multiple branches or tentacles coming out of it. Each of these branches or tentacles is actually an individual little zooid, specialized for a particular task like feeding, swimming, or reproduction. Oh, everybody's jealous of the reproductive zooids. <laughs> Always a feeder. One of the most Interesting aspects of them though is how they eat actually. They're active predators and they use those long tentacles to capture small fish and like plankton and stuff. However, unlike a lot of predators, siphonophores don't just use their tentacles to capture their prey. What they do is they use these stinging cells called nematocysts, which are located on the surface of their tentacles to paralyze their prey. And once their prey is immobilized, tentacles coil around and bring it to the siphonophore's mouth, which is located at the base of the tentacles. And yep, you are definitely gonna be 
be thinking about that tonight when you try to go to sleep. Now, despite all these cool things I have told you, there's still so much we don't know about them because they're largely a mystery. They're difficult to study and understand, mostly because they're really far down deep in the ocean where we can't get at, and they're also extremely fragile. But boy, are they weird. And if you're looking for more strange stories about horrors under the water, well, this is part two, so you already know we've got plenty of videos on that, and oh my god, if you like the Megalodon, we've got a video or two for you. But if you don't want stuff from the ocean, we got just about anything scary you could think of. Click on through and subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell and don't miss a scream. But, whew, slow down there, buddy. Do that at the end of this video, okay? I got way more weird sea creatures for you. Number four, the immortal jellyfish. We're all born to die. Are we not? That's what Lana Del Rey said, and I trust her more than anyone. Well, us humans, maybe. But some of us are built different, like the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish is a fascinating and downright eerie creature that's got the attention of scientists and the public alike. This thing is tiny, it's only about five millimeters inside, it's found all over the world, and it has an incredibly unique ability to regenerate its cells and reverse its aging process, effectively making it immortal. So far, this is the only creature that's been shown to prestige once it hits max level. It's a little joke for my Modern Warfare friends. This means that the immortal jellyfish can genuinely live forever as long as it doesn't fall prey to predators. Pretty good deal. While the idea of immortality sounds like a dream, I mean that's like what half of like all science fiction stories are about is trying to make yourself immortal, the immortal jellyfish has raised concerns about the impact of its population growth on ecosystems. Because these things technically have the potential to live forever, it's got the ability to reproduce rapidly and take over the habitats of other species, disrupting the balance of marine ecosystems. This could lead to an extinction of other species, and who knows what kind of ripples that would have on the food chain. And even though they're pretty small, I think an army of immortal jellyfish are actually kind of scary. Scientists are studying the creature's unique ability to regenerate its cells and hope that maybe they can unlock the secrets of human aging and potentially develop new treatments. This definitely has the possibility to benefit humanity in many ways. It sure would be awesome to live to like 300, but it also raises a ton of ethical questions and who knows what that kind of technology or research could look like in the wrong hands. If you've ever played the video game Bioshock, I feel like you should already know a thing or two about the dangers of harvesting undersea creatures for their DNA to inject into humans, it did not work well for anybody in Rapture. It was terrible there. So maybe it's best we leave those cells inside the jellyfish. Coming up next on the list is going to be the Baltic Sea Anomaly. It's a very strange, unexplained object that was discovered in 2011 at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Now, this object is about 60 meters long, and it's been described as a giant mushroom-shaped stone, or maybe a crashed UFO, or some even think a sunken city. A UFO underwater. Does that make it an unexplained swimming object? A USO? Of course, there are some who think that the Baltic Sea anomaly could just be a natural formation formed from years of erosion, but that would be boring. Despite numerous attempts to study the anomaly and try and figure out just what it is, it remains a puzzle to scientists and a source of fascination. I mean, that's why we're still calling it the Baltic Sea anomaly, not the Baltic Sea we know what it is. Definitely the most scary thing about it is that it's completely shrouded in uncertainty. This thing was discovered by accident. You know, they weren't even looking for it. They were looking for shipwrecks and happened to find it. And since then, it has been the subject of constant speculation. Some, like I said before, believe that it could just be a natural formation, while others argue that this could be a shining piece of evidence towards an ancient civilization or even extraterrestrial life. There are some as well who are concerned that it could be a threat to the environment around it because there are some studies that have suggested that possibly the object could be leaking toxic chemicals or even, God forbid, radiation, which would have some pretty scary implications for the Baltic Sea and the people who live near its shores. As well, the fact that we know just like so little about this thing makes us wonder what could happen in the future. Could this be a Godzilla situation where this is a sleeping kaiju beneath the oceans that's gonna come up and destroy a city? Probably not, but it could be. The Baltic Sea Anomaly, we may never find out a single thing about it. It's going to keep our imaginations going for years until we figure out just what it is. Who knows what dangers could be lurking. Could be nothing, but could be something. A reminder of how little we truly, truly know about what lies beneath the water. Number two, Sakoyam. What is the last thing you think you'd want to discover at the bottom of the ocean? Is it the Kraken? 
Cursed pirate treasure. A cavern full of misshapen skulls and bones. It's the last one. That's the only real one out of three because that's our next point. This underwater cavern in particular, one Sakuyam, is located in the Yucatan. It's a sea note and a sea note is a natural pit from the collapse of limestone bedrock that exposes groundwater underneath. And the Mayans sometimes used to use sea notes as places to perform like a little bit of human sacrifice. Like just a little bit, like a teeny tiny little bit of human sacrifice. This sea note sits outside the ruins of the ancient Mayan city of Mayapan, south of the capital of Yucatan. It was a major political center from the 12th to 15th century and contained within its stone walls a secret Mayan city. Now there were around 40 sea notes which served as water sources for the residents and a pretty convenient place to store the misshapen bones of your human sacrifices. Legend says that this particular sea note is noteworthy for being guarded by a feathered horse-headed serpent. And when researchers dove in, they discovered there were very real reasons to be afraid. Bones scattered across the sea floors. 15 sets of bones marked by 15 bizarrely elongated skulls. These skulls were flattened during infancy. Um, why the Mayans did this is a bit puzzling to researchers and, and me. Uh, I don't know how much you know about like anatomy and biology, but traditionally, this skull works best when it's not flattened. Now, interestingly, researchers believe that these people weren't sacrificed, but rather their bones were laid to rest here to get closer to the underworld as they await the next cycle of rebirth. I only hope we didn't disturb them. I don't want to wake someone up while they're sleeping. And number one, the Yonaguni Monument. Now, you've definitely heard of the lost city of Atlantis, this mythical city that could have been signs of an ancient, technologically advanced civilization that people believe sunk. But have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? It's been called the Japanese Atlantis. It's a mysterious structure found off the coast of Japan that's quite puzzled with scientists and researchers for decades. Some argue that it was crafted by an ancient civilization. Now, the monument itself is a sprawling complex of stone structures, steps and platforms, and the most defining feature is this massive pyramid that looms over it with precise angles and straight lines that make it seem like somebody engineered this thing rather than this thing just happened. It defies natural explanation. Many people believe that this monument was created by some unknown ancient civilization that's been completely lost to history. The design and precision of the stone suggests that it was crafted, crafted with care and skill, likely by a culture with technology a little more advanced than ours. If it's a conspiracy you prefer that aliens did it, then definitely it's a possibility that aliens built this thing. Now, others believe that the monument is simply a natural formation, and I can already hear you booing that has been shaped by the forces of erosion and tectonic activity as if you really believe in erosion it's all a scam they argue that the angles and straight lines are simply coincidental and the monument is nothing more than a curious formation sure that's plausible, but it does feel like a bit of a cop-out, and I just don't buy it personally. I'm usually more of a skeptic than not, but I have trouble believing that erosion and the passage of time could create something so strongly looking like a lost city. It would just be a very big cosmic coincidence, is all I'm saying. Now we know so little about the monument, and perhaps we never will, and that's just what makes it so interesting. So you let me know down below, what do you think the Yonaguni Monument is? Something from an ancient culture, evidence of aliens on Earth long before us, or just some rocks that happen to look like a temple. Number five on this list is the Tiger Shark Detective. I've named this the Tiger Shark Detective because the catching of this shark actually played a crucial role in a murder mystery. It all started when two fishermen back in 1935 caught a tiger shark off the coast of Australia. They brought the shark back to shore and donated it to an aquarium. This shark was in the local news at this point and had quite the name for itself. A week into it being at this aquarium during a live feeding where there was actual literal onlookers watching, this shark caught coughed up what looked to be a human arm. The police obviously got involved at this point and had to do some investigating to see how it got there. They determined through a series of tests that the arm had not been bitten off by the shark, but that it had been chopped off by something else and that the shark had swallowed it whole. The story would have been over, but the arm had something on it that distinguished it from other arms. It had a tattoo. This was a rare tattoo, and back then tattoos themselves were pretty rare altogether. Investigators soon realized that it was the same tattoo that a former police informant had on his arm, Jim Smith. He had gone missing a while back and they had no idea what happened to him. They started piecing it all together and looked into what potentially went wrong. They then realized that Jim had tried to blackmail the wrong people and it 
hadn't gone so great for him. The murderers then killed Jim and disposed of his body, but kept the arm because they knew that the tattoo would be able to lead people to the conclusion that it was Jim. They anchored this arm down and threw it in the water, not suspecting that a tiger shark would eat it and then later be caught by a fisherman. Eventually, the police tracked down the killers and brought them to justice, and it was all because these two fishermen fished up a tiger shark that just happened to eat some pretty important evidence. Number four on this list is the Chimera Lobster. Catching a lobster isn't really that impressive, but what if you caught a lobster that looked as if it came straight from another dimension? A little bit more mysterious if you ask me. Cracked writes, when Alan Robinson headed out to sea in Bar Harbor, Maine in July of 2006, he, like all commercial fishermen, was hoping for a little luck. What he hauled into his boat that day was a 1 in 50 million discovery. It looks like a fish torture delicacy, but it's actually a natural phenomenon. Well, if you consider something that happens practically never a natural phenomenon. A chimera occurs when two zygotes with different cells, and sometimes from different species, combine together to form a single creature or person. Yeah, there have been human chimeras who are the genetic equivalent of having non-identical twins in one body. Unfortunately, the human versions are far less dramatic looking than what you might expect based on the lobster. We're talking legend Legendary Pokemon levels of rare here, guys. Like, this lobster is something seriously special. And just look at that thing. It's split directly down the middle. One half looks cooked and ready to serve, and the other half looks like a regular everyday lobster. This is just one way that this phenomenon can appear. There have been reports where lobsters can come out as blue before, or even harlequin. It's a very mysterious event when it happens, and one of the rarest on the entire planet. Number three in this list is the one-eyed shark. So before we even get into this entry, let's pull up a picture of what I'm talking about so you guys can see. This is the shark that I'm talking about, and it looks pretty fake, right? Well, that's that's exactly what the internet came out and said, but it turns out that this one-eyed freak of a shark thing might actually be legit. Let's pull up a few of the later shots of this shark and see how you guys feel now. Cracked talks about these other pictures and says, in these later shots, some time has passed and the creature is noticeably a little worse for wear in comparison to the originals. The gentleman in the pictures above is Dr. Philippe Galvin, one of Mexico's most renowned shark researchers. While it was reported by Pisces fleet that Dr. Galvin had seen stuff studied and produced an initial paper on this otherworldly animal, and was awaiting review and publication, skeptics still voiced their disdain, complaining now that the shark had to be a creation of special effects artists and that it didn't have gill slits. But the skeptics were soon put to bed because, apparently, when a pregnant bull shark was recently caught by a commercial fisherman in the Sea of Cortez, the albino cyclops shark was one of the unborn fetuses found inside. Pretty crazy stuff if you ask me, guys. Also kind of creepy that the one-eyed shark is just an unborn fetus? I guess nature really do just be like that sometimes. Number two on this list is a skull. Finding body parts in the ocean, or actually anywhere in the world, has got to be pretty jarring. I'd imagine that probably the most jarring of those body parts, though, would be a human skull. Reeling that up on your fishing line when you're expecting to catch some rainbow trout has got to be quite the shock. Well, this case is actually way worse than that. Imagine going fishing, fishing up a human skull, and then having that human skull literally be the skull of one of your former best friends. Yeah, that's right guys. What I just described there is exactly what went down to Barry Hunter in 2007. He found the skull of Brian Allison, someone who had gone missing several years prior, and someone who Barry would often go drinking with. The commercial trawler, the Jan Denise II, was found at the bottom of the ocean several years prior. Brian Allison Allison was on that boat, and it was assumed that he perished when the ship went down, but his body, it was never recovered. His family, ever since that ship had gone down, were truly in a horrible place mentally. They inherently understood that Brian had most likely died at the bottom of the ocean, but without ever receiving confirmation, it truly left them in this horrible gray area that they could never escape. This finding from Barry finally gave them the closure that they needed to move on with their lives. Still, it must have been absolutely horrifying for Barry, who actually found the thing and then later realized who it was. And finally, number one on this list is the ghost ship. This is definitely not something that you and your buddies would want to find if you're out for a relaxing fishing trip. Rock 
Rocket Geeks writes, Encountering other ships at sea during a fishing trip isn't such a rare occurrence, but what if they're ghost ships with their occupants still on board? In 2016, two fishermen noticed a strange vessel drifting about 50 miles away from the Philippines. Disturbed by the ship's appearance, they decided to board it to see if anyone was on it. What they found was the decomposing body of German explorer Fritz Bahorhat, who was last seen in 2009, which had been almost perfectly preserved by the salty air and dry winds. What's crazy to me is that this guy's ship was able to just drift through the ocean for so long without being spotted at all. Apparently after doing an autopsy on Fritz, he had died on his boat of a heart attack years ago. His boat obviously wasn't anchored or anything when he died, so the wind and the water just took it. During that entire time, it never capsized or hit land. It was just floating in the water for years, letting his body mummify completely. I think this story, more than any that we've looked at today, is just a perfect example at how massive the ocean can be. For years, an entire yacht carrying a dead human being was just going around without anyone seeing it. Who knows how far this boat had traveled during that time or what it had seen. It also begs the question, how many more of these boats are out there right now? Now just floating around. The ocean is a scary and massive place, guys. These are just a few of the mysteries we found in it, but I guarantee there are plenty more. At number five, underwater river. Within the ocean, there was a river found, and it's known as the Black Sea Undersea River. This discovery was the first of its kind in the entire world at the time and was found in August of 2010. The underwater river is saline water flowing through the Bosporus Strait and along the seabed of the Black Sea. Before this discovery, scientists had previously found channels running along the ocean floor based on sonar screening. One of the largest is from the mouth of the Amazon River into the Atlantic Ocean and found off the coast of Greenland, the Congo and Bengal. It was believed that these channels could possibly function as rivers. It was this discovery specifically that truly proved their theory correct. This river functions due to the salty ocean water spilling through the Bosporus Strait from the Mediterranean Sea into the Black Sea, where the water has a lower salt content. The largest of these rivers are several miles wide and run for thousands of miles out into the deep ocean, and they prove to be vital to the creatures living in and around them. In many ways, these underwater rivers are very similar to rivers we see on land. They have banks on either side and smaller rivers feed into the larger ones. These rivers carve valleys into the sea floor and they follow certain paths and can even change course. Due to the power and unpredictability of these rivers, they have been extremely difficult to explore and learn more about. Researchers tend to send down recording instruments and robotic submarines to try and learn more about these rivers. Sedimentologist Dan Parsons says that these rivers are incredibly powerful and have destructive flows, so it's important we understand how they work. If it was a river on the surface of the Earth, then it was ranked as the sixth largest river in the world. This discovery is truly an amazing natural wonder, and because they are so hard to research, study, and learn about is an incredible phenomenon. In at number four, we have Great Blue Hole. The Great Blue Hole is located in Belize and is truly a wonder. The hole is a natural sinkhole with surrounding corals and shallow water accounting for the perfect circle shape and deep blue color. It lies near the center of Lighthouse Reef and it was formed during several occurrences of quaternary glaciation when the sea levels were much lower. Fun fact about the Lighthouse Reef can actually be seen from space and the Great Blue Hole is near the center of it and can see it so clearly from so far away. This site was made famous by Jacques Cousteau who declared it one of the top five scuba diving sites in the world. It was first discovered in 1971 and then explored much more during an expedition in 1997 to collect core sample from the Blue Hole's floor and document the cave system. In December 2018, two submarines descended into the Blue Hole to be able to map its interior and using solar scanning, they were able to make a 3D map of the 1,000 foot wide hole. They discovered that there was a layer of hydrogen sulfide around 300 feet down. The Great Blue Hole has its name for a reason. It is extremely deep and it has measured over 400 feet deep. At that depth, it becomes very dark, cold, and not much can survive down there. The submarine expedition also discovered bodies of two divers at the bottom. They were believed to be two out of three divers who had gone missing while diving there. This massive hole is a very popular spot for scuba divers for its crystal blue color and being able to see many different species in and around the area. 
There are many different types of fish including the midnight parrotfish and the Caribbean reef shark along with different shark species like the bull shark and hammerheads. In 2012 the Discovery Channel ranked the Great Blue Hole as number 1 on its list of the top 10 most amazing places on earth and if you're interested in checking out this natural wonder there are full day trips from the coastal tourist communities in Belize and you can explore the Great Blue Hole. In at number 3 we have vampire squids. Not only are vampires on land but they also been found in the ocean. The vampire squids reside throughout the oceans all around the world, mainly in tropical oceans in extreme deep sea conditions. This squid uses its organs and its unique oxygen metabolism to be able to thrive in the parts of the ocean with the lowest concentrations of oxygen, which is extremely hard to do for many other sea creatures. The vampire squid is the only known cephalopod able to live its entire life in what's known as the oxygen minimum zone, at saturations as low as 3%. These squids were discovered during the Valdivia expedition in 1898, which was led by Carl Chun, a zoologist who was inspired by the Challenger expedition and wanted to verify that life does indeed exist below 300 feet. Back then, much of the sea wasn't known about, let alone explored, so this was very new for that time, and during that expedition, the vampire squid was found. When the discovery was made, they were originally described as an octopus because of their physical appearance and eight arms, but they are united by a web of skin and were later assigned to be part of the squid family. These scary sea creatures can grow to a length of one foot, and their gelatinous body varies in colour from jet black to a pale reddish depending on location and lighting conditions. It is blue or red coloured eyes are some of the largest in the entire animal kingdom. If these creatures become agitated they will eject a sticky cloud of glow in the dark like mucus which will stick to their predators and make them visible to other predators while the vampire squid escapes. In at number 2 we have chimera fish. These fish are famously called the voodoo doll fish because they look like someone took many different types of parts of fish and mashed them all together creating a terrifying looking deep sea creature. In Greek mythology the chimera was a monstrous fire breathing hybrid creature. These fish are closely related to sharks and to date there are 50 species of chimera have been recorded worldwide. Most of these fish can be found in the deep ocean, in depths of over 500 meters down so little is known about these mysterious deep sea animals because they are so difficult to study let alone find. The chimera fish varies in colour from black to pale blue to brownish grey and have long bodies with exceptionally large heads. Their eyes are large and translucent with a green colour which helps them to see in the dark deep sea. These fish tend to feed on bottom dwelling creatures like crabs, octopi, marine worms and sea urchins. The chimera crush their prey with their three rows of sharp teeth and like sharks they use electroreception to find their prey in the dark. The creatures are said to have originated over 400 million years ago during the Silurian times but because of today's overfishing they are usually a big target, particularly in coastal waters. These creatures are essential to the deep sea ecosystem, they tend to live up to 30 years old and they also reach sexual maturity late and produce few young so being a target to fisheries is a huge issue for them. If you're ever going scuba diving I would beware of the predatory creatures but thankfully they tend to reside in the deep sea but they are found in oceans all throughout the world except in Antarctica. And finally in and one we have garbage. One of the most terrifying on this list is the amount of garbage in our oceans. Garbage is ugly and it is a threat to all of us on land and especially those living in the oceans. Whenever you go to a beach no matter in your hometown or on the other side of the world on vacation you have probably seen some sort of garbage or debris floating in the water or on the beach. The amount of waste in our oceans have created islands of trash that collect into massive piles that float on the surface. One of the most notorious ones is the Great Pacific Patch or the Trash Vortex which spans from the west coast of North America to Japan. Last year it was recorded that there are about 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic waste in our oceans and studies expect this number to triple in the next two decades if no significant action is taken. When researchers and divers travelled down to the deepest part of the ocean which was a record depth there was one thing that was so unexpected that they saw. This expedition was done by American undersea explorer Victor Vescovo who was the first person to dive to the deepest points of the earth's ocean travelling over 35,000 feet and is the deepest man seen dive ever recorded. During his dive he discovered something truly terrifying and completely unexpected. In the deepest part of the ocean where no one has ever travelled, a plastic bag was found. Not only are there large pieces of plastic and garbage in our oceans, but it's the microplastic and the remains of trash that are still composting that are more threatening to marine life than anything because they can quickly enter and poison the creatures living in our oceans and even people. 
The ocean is vital to our survival and the amount of garbage and plastic found in our oceans is baffling and we as humans need to make some serious changes. Coming in at number 5 we have Stranded Ship. In Zakynthos, Greece, on the beautiful beaches lays a haunting sight of a stranded and rusting MV Panagiotis ship washed up on the shore in 1980 and continues to lay on the sand to this day. Many tourists come to view this phenomenon and due to the mysterious ship it's been nicknamed Shipwreck Beach. Little is known about the ship and is highly debated. One theory is that the ship was used for smuggling and abandoned when the crew were being pursued by the navy on their way to Piraeus from Albania. Another theory states that the ship was making its way from Turkey with the freight of contraband cigarettes headed for Italy. When encountering stormy weather, the ship went into a cove where the crew abandoned the ship in fear of getting caught. Soon after the ship was abandoned, rumours started swirling that the ship had many valuable items on it and authorities eventually convicted 29 people for looting cargo and valuable equipment from the wrecked ship. The location of the Panagiotis was prominently featured in the hit Korean drama Descendants of the Sun, leading to a surge of interest among Chinese and Korean tourists. This beach was briefly closed for tourists in 2018 due to the fear of landslides due to a large boulder falling onto the beach, but left the ship unharmed. The beach was later opened and that same year the beach was named as the world's best beach in a poll by over 1,000 travel journalists and professionals. The beach and surrounding areas are stunning but the mysterious of the ship lingers and gives creepy vibes when you're on vacation in such a beautiful place. Some tourists have stated while getting close to the ship they've heard noises coming from inside and some locals believe that this ship is haunted by the past crew members. In at number 4 we have numerous lost cities. One of the most famous lost cities that have been located in the ocean is the lost city of Atlantis. The lost city used to actually consist of a few islands where the founders had created a utopian civilization and became a great naval power. Their home consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked by a canal. The island of gods contained gold, silver and other precious metal and had an abundance of rare and exotic wildlife. Many believe Atlantis and the story behind it was a fictional story that was created by an ancient Greek philosopher Plato, but others believe it was a real story and that the lost city is supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean, while others say it's the Mediterranean or under Antarctica, and this is a popular debate. Besides the highly debated Atlantis, there are currently at least a dozen lost cities that rest at the bottom of the ocean near places like Greece, Japan and India. The sunken palace of Cleopatra is one of the most fabled underwater remnants of the ancient world. It had sunken more than 1400 years ago when an earthquake and tsunami hit Alexandria, Egypt. One of the most spectacular and intact lost cities is Shicheng, or otherwise known as the Lion City, which is located at the bottom of China's Kwandeo Lake. Not from ancient times, but apparently it was purposely flooded in 1959 to make room for a dam and an adjoining hydroelectric station. Another lost city comes from Dwarka, India, which is known as the Gateway to Heaven, which was an ancient city dating back as far back as 574 AD. The ancient Dwarka was sunken by the rising of the ocean levels and taken to the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Cambay. Marine archaeological explorations have shed light on the structures and other artifacts these ancient people lived in. Many things have been seen and recovered like ancient structures, grids, pillars, stone anchors, pottery, stone sculptures, bronze, copper and so much more. In at number 3, a suspected UFO. In 2011 a group of Swedish divers discovered a mysterious object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The divers that were exploring the sea floor that came across the UFO shaped object had their equipment stopped working as they approached the object. Professional diver Steven Hogenburn who is part of the Ocean X team said that some of the team's cameras and satellite phones refused to work when directly above the object and would only work when they were at least 200 meters away from the so called UFO. The Swedish diving team noted there was a 985 foot flattened out runway leading up to the object, implying that it skidded along the path before stopping. Member Dennis Asberg said, I am 100% convinced and confident that we have found something that is very, very, very unique. Many of the divers were convinced that their finding was in fact a UFO, but some added theories that maybe the object could have been a meteorite or an asteroid, a volcano or a U-boat from the Cold War, but no one was really sure. The divers had returned to the site the next year to get a better look at the anomaly and had in fact found a second object near the first finding. 
They had taken a sonar image of the new finding due to mysterious electrical interference. It wasn't much of a clear image, and the group had only released the original finding image because the second finding was so blurry. With only a single blurry image and little information, many speculate that the object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea could in fact be a UFO, a portal into another world, or even an underwater Stonehenge. The theories received more attention when artist Hawk Vact had created a 3D interpretation of the mysterious object, which looks eerily similar to a UFO or something not of this world. On December 10th, 2014, the website Earth We Are One actually published an article claiming a UFO shaped like a Millennium Falcon from Star Wars had been discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and explained more about the dive and findings. We may never really know what this mysterious object truly is, and many believe it might be, but others believe it could be something else, but no one really knows. In at number two, we have Giant Eyeball. In 2012, a giant eyeball was found by a beachcomber in Pompano Beach in Florida, and this discovery is baffling wildlife officials. The softball sized eyeball was reported to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and then sent to the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg to be put on ice so further analysis could be done to try and figure out what sea creature this eyeball had come from. Marine biologists will use genetic testing to try and solve this mystery and try and find an answer. When the picture came out of this mysterious eyeball, the internet went crazy and the mystery eyeball soon went viral. And some have suggested that the eye came from a monster fish, a giant squid, or even a whale. Many people are leaning towards the eyeball is from a giant squid, but the spokeswoman for the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, Carly Seckelson, said they are leaning toward a different scenario. The primary suspect right now would be a large fish like a swordfish, a tuna of some sort of deep water fish species. Heather Bracken Grissom, an assistant professor in the marine science program at Florida International University in Miami, believed that this huge blue eyeball may have come from a deep sea squid or a large swordfish. The professor and her colleagues concluded that the eyeball's lens and pupil are similar in shape to that of a deep sea squid and noted that a deep sea squid's eyeball can be as large as a soccer ball and can easily become dislodged. After the marine biologist's test came back, they were still left with not many answers of what creature this eyeball came from, but it was determined to have bone fragments around it, debunking the theory of it being from a giant squid. Many different parts of different sea creatures have washed up or have been discovered by divers, but soon determined by marine biologists to be a specific sea creature or species, but this eyeball continues to be a mystery. This story just proves that we know very little about the ocean and who or what is swimming down there, especially in the deepest depths of the sea. And finally, in at number one, we have Icicle of Death or better known as the icy finger of death. It creeps through the ocean's depth like a frozen eel, an eerie phenomenon known as brine icicles. Brine icicles are most commonly called the icicles of death. It freezes everything it touches. Only discovered in the 1960s, these things grow towards the sea floor from the base of the Arctic and Antarctica sea ice. This phenomenon happens when extremely cold brine sink to the bottom of the water, reaching warmer seawater below. The water around it flash freezes, creating a descending tube of ice known as a brinicle. Sometimes an underwater icicle reaches the sea floor, and when it does, a web of ice forms and spreads, entombing and freezing everything in its path, including any unlucky sea life, such as a starfish and sea urchins. Andrew Thurber, professor at Oregon State University and avid diver, had actually seen a brinicle bloom firsthand and stated, they look like an upside down cacti that are blown from glass, like something from Dr. Zeus's imagination. They're incredibly delicate and can break with only the slightest touch. The formation of a brinicle was first filmed in 2011 by producer Catherine Jeffs and cameraman Hugh Miller and Doug Anderson for the BBC series Frozen Planet. They can even create brine pools, which are called the Black Pool of Death, and are toxic to marine animals due to their high salinity and anoxic properties, which can lead to toxic shock and possibly death. Based on what scientists have learned so far, they believe life on Earth may have originated from these tentacles and that they may even harbor conditions suitable for life to form on other planets and moons. Number five on this list is Julia. According to Wikipedia, Julia is a sound recorded on March 1st, 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA said the source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that had run aground off Antarctica. It was large enough to be heard over over the entire Equatorial Pacific Ocean Autonomous Hydrophone Array with a duration of about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Due to the uncertainty of the arrival azimuth, the point of origin could only be narrowed to between Bransford Straits and Cape Adar. The most accepted explanation is that a massive iceberg scraped along the ground, but in truth, it could be anything. 
This was a one-off sound, so we'll likely never know for sure, but an iceberg, a massive animal, some underground volcanoes, maybe even tectonic plates shifting, all of these are potential explanations for why this sound may have come about, and none of them are great. This sound was huge, and if this is what it sounds like for tectonic plates to shift, then they're probably shifting around in ways that we don't really need them to be doing right now. Also, there was a rumor that NASA had photographs of the body of water that was suspected, and that there was a massive shadow in it. People believe that they may have been able to capture a photo of some giant creature down there, but don't want to reveal such information to the public. If the creature is as big as people think, then I kind of understand why. Number four on this list is the upsweep. Schneider writes, Upsweep is an unidentified sound that's existed at least since the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory began recording SOSUS, an underwater sound surveillance system with listening stations around the world in 1991. The sound consists of a long train of narrow band upsweeping sounds of several seconds duration each, the laboratory reports. The source location is difficult to identify, but it's in the Pacific around the halfway point between Australia and South America. Upsweep changes with the seasons becoming loudest in spring and autumn, though it isn't clear why. The leading theory is that it's related to volcanic activity. This sound or signal is very unique because it keeps coming back and changes with the weather. Frankly, I don't really understand how this could possibly be related to volcanic activity because the season is dictating how loud or soft the noise is. Why would the fact that we're in fall change anything about a volcano's activity and therefore the sound? Is it possible that this explanation is just an explanation of convenience and the fact of the matter is no one really has any idea why this is happening or maybe even worse they do know why it's happening and are just covering it up anyways. Number three on this list is the hum. The hum is one of the most interesting signals from the deep ocean that we've ever run into. Caitlin Schneider writes, The hum has been recorded on several occasions, mostly during the last 50 years or so. In these cases, there have been reports of a relentless and troubling low-frequency humming noise that can only be heard by a certain portion of the population. It's difficult to pinpoint when instances of the hum began, but it's been well documented since the 1970s, and since then, cases have popped up all over the world from Ontario, Canada, to Taos, New Mexico, to Bristol, England, to Largue, Scotland, and Auckland, New Zealand. In most instances, the affected group only makes up 2% of the population, but for those individuals, the hum is largely inescapable and impossible to track. Those affected report never having heard noises before and say the hum is generally heard indoors and becomes louder at night. It's also most common in rural and suburban areas and among people between age 55 and 70. Scientists have long investigated the cause of the drone, occasionally tracing it to industrial equipment emitting particular frequencies. For the most part though, the sound has left the world completely puzzled. The list of other possible culprits is long and wide ranging. Wireless communication devices, power or gas lines, electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, earth tremors, or the ocean are all suspects. Because the hum appears and disappears, and because the cause may vary from case to case, the phenomenon still baffles researchers. At this point, a few things are clear. The hum is real and likely a byproduct of 21st century living. They think that this sound might come from the ocean, but they're also really not that sure. This is one of those ones that just really doesn't make any sense. Caitlin writes at the end there that it might be a product of 21st century living, but I frankly don't understand that. How is our way of living causing this hum to come from the ocean all around the globe at totally random times? Also, why is it that people from the ages of 55 to 70 are more affected by this? It's stuff like this that reminds me that we aren't as smart as we think we are. Sometimes I think that we're so advanced that we have it all figured out, but then I'm reminded that there's just this massive hum that occasionally happens which nobody knows why. What it means or what it could do is all a mystery, which honestly adds to the scare factor. Number two on this list is skyquakes. So when you hear skyquakes, you probably don't think that they have anything to do with the water, but they actually do. Caitlin Schneider says that skyquakes or unexplained sonic booms have been heard around the world for the last 200 years or so, usually near bodies of water. These head scratchers have been reported on the Ganges in India, the East Coast and Inland Finger Lakes of the US, near the North Sea, and in Australia, Japan, and Italy. The sounds which has been described as mimicking massive thunder or cannon fire has been chalked up to everything from meteors and 
entering the atmosphere to gas escaping from vents in the Earth's surface, or the gas exploding after being trapped underwater as a result of biological decay, to earthquakes, military aircraft, underwater caves collapsing, and even a possible byproduct of solar and or Earth based magnetic activity. So there's a lot of explanations there, but I want to circle back to the one about gas getting trapped underwater. Apparently the gas gets trapped and then causes an explosion. Well what if a ton of gas gets trapped? What if so much gas gets trapped that the explosion doesn't just cause a sound, but actually causes a catastrophic event? It leads to a huge tsunami that just wipes out an entire city. If this is the explanation for the sound, then I don't see why that isn't possible. Which would mean that whenever we hear such a thing, it's just a potential natural disaster waiting to happen. All that makes it a pretty scary sound if you ask me. And finally, number one is the bloop. Potentially one of the most infamous sounds ever recorded from the ocean the bloop has kept experts guessing for years. In 1997, a super low frequency but massively powerful sound was heard in multiple spots around the globe. Experts think that it originated off the coast of South Africa, but are not 100% sure. The fact that it was heard repeatedly over and over again during the summer of 1997, but then was never heard of after that. No one really knows what caused this massive sound, and maybe the most terrifying part is that scientists haven't ruled out something organic. Something organic means something living. A massive, massive creature that would break records for anything that we've ever seen before. Far larger than a blue whale, the largest known creature on the planet. This would be groundbreaking if it was something organic and would totally change the way we look at the ocean. Conspiracy theorists have thought that the government does know what it is and is actually keeping it under wraps for fear of how the public will respond. Some people even believe that it might be Cthulhu, the ancient god written about in the Lovecraftian universe. Now once again, the most accepted explanation is that of a massive iceberg scraping the ground, but if that's what caused it, then why did it keep happening over and over again? Comment down below what you guys think is the true cause of this bloop, because I truly have no idea.